Growing up, I never went to summer camp, mainly because my parents couldn't afford it. I remember asking one year if I could go, but it got shut down quickly since my parents could barely make ends meet. However, I was able to attend sports camps in the summer. It was similar to your typical summer camps, except you mainly focused on a specific sport. In my case, it was basketball. It was just for one week out of the summer, and you would do drills, play games, eat, make friends, and just have a good time. After graduating, my life took a turn in a direction I never expected. I started coaching basketball at the high school level and teaching the fundamentals of the game to grade school children. After a successful first year as a coach, I reached out to the community to see if a basketball summer camp would be something that they were interested in. I was overwhelmed by the support that I got. So, before the end of the school year, I found a gym to rent out and I decided to host a basketball camp for kids from 4th grade through 10th grade. It would be first come, first serve, and when all the spots are filled, that would be the end. The camp would be Monday through Saturday and it would be a sleepover camp as well. And to my absolute joy, every spot was filled within just a couple of days. I couldn't wait to get started in this venture of mine. When we were packing up our stuff on the last day of sign-ups, a very angry man entered the gym screaming, saying, Hey, where do you think you're going? I'm signing up my boy right now, so hold on. I was immediately annoyed by this guy's tone, but I still calmly said to the guy, Sorry, sir, every spot's been filled. I apologize. I, I wish I could take every kid. Well, this guy wasn't having it. He started making a scene, kicking over chairs. I tried to get him to calm down so I could explain to him why I could only take a certain number of kids, but he wouldn't stop his freakout scene. I felt bad for the kid, honestly. Thankfully, the kid wasn't with him so I didn't have to witness that, but I understand what it's like to want to give your kid something, and sometimes the world says no. He finally left after a few minutes, ranting about how I haven't seen the last of him, and I'll be sorry. Now as a coach, I have been threatened by parents a million times and I never take it seriously. Most of the time, parents just want what's best for their kids and they'll say stupid stuff all the time so I treated this incident no differently. And finally, camp time was here. I ran the camp a lot like basketball camps I went to when I was a kid. Drills, scrimmages, downtime and even some fun games for character building and team camaraderie. My staff of coaches and I really worked the kids hard on the first day. That first night, almost every camper was asleep by 8 or 9 p.m., which was great for us since we didn't have to try to wrangle and calm dozens of teenagers down. This pattern of hard work and early nights continued for a couple of days. By Wednesday, I only had one kid that wanted to go home, and after a nice conversation, we convinced him to stick it out and stay. That night at around 11 p.m. I was making my rounds to make sure all the kids were asleep or at least in bed and not being a distraction for everybody else. The location of the camp was in an old school that wasn't used for classes anymore but was updated and really nice. To paint the picture a little better for you, the campers slept in various classrooms. Before you scratch your head and say how, before the camp started, we went in and converted the classrooms to some livable quarters. They were much like cabins you would see in an outdoor summer camp just inside an old school. Now after my walkthrough, I was able to confirm that most of the kids were asleep or at the very least in their beds. On the other side of the sleeping quarters was the gym. To get to the gym, you would have to walk down a long hallway and then cut through the cafeteria which also held the stage where students at one time performed plays and band shows. While I was walking through the cafeteria, I could hear something coming from the stage. I shouted up to the stage asking whoever was up there to come down. I figured it was just one of the kids or a coach or something, but I couldn't figure out why they would be up there. I shouted again and got no response. There was clearly someone up there because the noise I heard was blatantly footsteps. That was unmistakable. In my stern coaching voice I shouted, Alright, I gave you a chance. I'm coming up there. I jumped up on the stage and was shining my flashlight all around. I couldn't see anybody and now I couldn't hear anything. And just as I was about to walk away from behind one of the curtains, I hear a voice. It was angry and low and he said, I told you to be sorry. I shined the light in the dark pockets of the curtain and from that sort of black void, I saw someone charge at me. 
Immediately I could tell, it was the guy, the angry parent from the sign-ups, and before I could even react, he's tackled me on the stage and started throwing punches into me. One of the other coaches heard the commotion going on, running in, and thankfully ripped the guy off of me. This guy was going crazy, flailing all over the stage. I had no choice, but once we subdued him, I called the police. Thank God they came quick, and they escorted the man out of the building. But, believe it or not, this is where the story actually gets crazy. The man's kid was already signed up in the camp. He was separated from the kid's mother and didn't have custody of him. Apparently, the man wasn't mentally well either, which is pretty obvious now. The mother told us and the police that she informed him several times that she signed up their son for a camp and I guess he was upset that he didn't get to sign up his son himself, claiming that it was a father's job or some weird reason like that. It was a very messy situation and I had to spend most of the next day contacting parents and letting them know what happened and that their children are safe. That was the only incident that ever occurred like that and I'm thankful that it didn't ruin the camp. It was scary in the moment, and every year before camp I think about that guy. I have no idea how he got in since all the doors were locked and there weren't any windows for him to get in. The only thing I can think of was that he arrived the first day and was hiding in the school the entire time that we were there, which just the thought of gives me the chills. It just makes me think, even when you think you're safe, you just really never know who might be watching you. I didn't realize how messed up this story was until just recently when I told my girlfriend and all her friends what had happened. I guess I'm sort of oblivious to certain things and I'm horrible at picking up signals. My girlfriend was flirting with me for weeks and I had no idea so yeah, I'm not the best at overthinking things. Now years ago, when I was 15 or 16, I don't remember the exact age, I attended a Christian summer camp. It wasn't like in your face religion or anything like that. It just blasted that Christian name to get people to come to the camp. In this part of the country, you're either Christian or nothing. My parents also thought that it would be a good idea to send me to camp. They thought that it would help me to socialize and meet friends since I am pretty awkward. Well, they were half right. I met Petey on the first day of camp and he was wearing a Captain America shirt. I was wearing a Captain America hat and we both laughed about it and instantly bonded. Petey was just like me. Socially awkward, dry sense of humor, and gigantic comic book nerd. We'd spent literally hours talking about comics and what we would love to see in movies someday, and this was long before the MCU was a thing. I believe Iron Man 1 had just come out before camp had started, and this love of comics was what ultimately separated Petey and me from the rest of the camp. Everyone would break off into huge groups and do all sorts of activities, and we'd stay back just to hang out. We both hated the water, so for any swimming activity, we just sat that out. One day, Petey brought me a bunch of notebook paper and showed me his skill at drawing. The guy was a freak when it came to drawing. He told me to write some of the ideas for my superhero stories and he would illustrate them. Oh, I love this idea. It got to the point where I didn't even realize that I was at camp anymore. I was sort of blind to everything else in the world except for my new buddy and it seemed like he felt the same. We would stay up in the early hours of the morning, writing and illustrating our own comics. And one night, one of the counselors decided to do a night walk. He saw us awake with our flashlights, drawing and writing, and he didn't get too mad because we weren't doing anything bad, but he still made us put everything away and go to bed. We were annoyed, but neither of us were rule breakers, so we did what we were told. The next night, we stayed up and did our thing. We talked about making sure that we were a little bit more vigilant and if we heard something, to make sure that we ducked down right away so we didn't get in trouble. During the night at some point we heard someone outside though. We put our flashlights out and jumped into our beds. We could hear the walking outside of our unit. The walk continued until it was in front of the building and the walk was slow and it just didn't feel right. I thought maybe that he was trying to be sneaky to catch someone breaking the rules but it felt wrong for some reason. Petey and I slept on the far side of the room so the door was probably 20 feet away if I had to guess. We could hear the doorknob beginning to shake, but for some reason, nobody was coming in. 
Petey and I both made eye contact and he mouthed the words, What is going on? I just shook my head because I didn't know. Petey got up and started walking towards the door. He whispered, Hey, who is it? Nobody answered right away. And he looked back at me and shrugged. And then a whisper came from the other side of the door. Hey, it's John. Open the door real quick. We were both confused. There was only one John that we knew at the camp and he was sleeping in our unit. Petey whispered back and said, Sorry, who? The only John we know is he's sleeping right here. The voice paused again and didn't answer. And then the doorknob started to shake again. Whoever this was, they were trying very hard to get into the unit. Finally, he'd said something again. Just open the door, bud. I'm just trying to make sure everyone's okay. Petey made the wise decision and said, Sorry, man. Counselors have a key. Go ask them. He started walking back to bed, and whoever this was started to try opening the door again. We both stared for a few seconds, and then we started to hear the loud thud of whoever was outside, and they were now throwing their body against the door. They only tried to do that about two or three times and then immediately stopped. We both got into our beds and just stayed quiet. We didn't have any clue what that was about. After several minutes we heard the doorknob one last time and then it stopped for the last time that night. We heard the footsteps creep by outside of the unit and then they were gone. The next day I saw a bunch of counselors talking and they looked frightened about something. We didn't say anything because we figured that it was probably someone playing a prank or something and we didn't want to get in trouble. The rest of the camp continued and Petey and I noticed that the counselors were now monitoring all night long. It seemed like one was awake at all hours of the night. On the last day we told them what had happened that night and he turned white as a ghost. He goes on to say, Oh, uh, it was probably just someone playing a joke. Nothing to worry about. He then went and immediately started talking to another one of the counselors. We went home and honestly I didn't really think about that incident too much until the story came up organically recently when we were all hanging out. I'm still incredibly close with Petey and I even called him the night that I told my girlfriend and he corroborated the entire story. She thinks whoever this John guy was, he had bad intentions. And maybe he did. His attitude and everything about him just seemed off and when I think about it, and I think about how everybody acted after that night, it makes sense that it could have been someone with ill intentions. But what do you think? Did this guy have those bad intentions or was it simply a camper doing a joke that might have gone too far? When I was younger, I was desperate to fit in and I would do anything to be considered one of the cool kids. Now when I was 15, my parents sent me to summer camp. I was excited at the opportunity to make new friends and hopefully try to convince the other campers how cool I actually was, or maybe even convince myself. Now when I showed up, I instantly gravitated towards the kids that I thought looked fun. There was a group of four guys standing by one of the cabins. They all had shaggy hair and looked like skaters of sorts, which at the time was what all the cool kids were doing, at least in my mind. Now the ringleader of this group, which seems like an appropriate way to put it, was a boy named Russ. He was wearing a Dallas Cowboys hat backward and was entertaining the other boys with certain jokes. As I approached the group, I started to laugh at Russ's story, even though I didn't get his joke. My fake understanding of his story was enough to be accepted into this group. Now a few days into camp, it was clear that I did choose the cool group. All the younger campers thought that they were pretty cool and all the campers our age always laughed at what we said. And we quickly became the funny guys, as we're getting in trouble almost daily for fooling around. This was right during the time of Johnny Knoxville on MTV and all that kind of stuff, so we thought we were cool doing dangerous tricks and stunts all around the camp. Russ even convinced one camper named Michael to jump off one of the roofs of one of the cabins onto a tree, claiming that he'd done it a million times. Well, Michael did this, and the tree branch snapped, causing Michael to fall, and I actually think he broke his arm. Russ didn't get in trouble, and Michael was forced to leave camp. 
and that was the moment that I started to realize that Russ may not have been the cool guy that he thought he was. As camp progressed, I started getting more annoyed with Russ. Maybe I was growing more mature, or maybe I just saw through his little game, but either way, I was kind of going through the motions now. At first, everybody laughed at Russ and loved him, but now, everyone was starting to get annoyed with him, and much like I was. He was obsessed with these pranks and playing pranks on campers that he deemed to be nerds or lesser than him. And one night, our group was sitting around our bunks telling scary stories and stories about things that happened in our hometowns, and that's when Russ stepped in and had to one-up us. In a confident and almost arrogant voice, Russ started to tell us a story, and he said, You guys think those are scary stories? Why don't you all you hear this one? I was waiting for the right time to bust this out, but tonight seems like a good night. I told you guys before that my brother went to this camp years ago when he was my age. He said that in the woods, there's an abandoned shack. It's not far from here, but it's in the direction that we don't travel for hikes and other activities. This shack is haunted, like actually haunted. The old camp director used to murder his victims in that shack until he was caught and died trying to escape the cops. They say his spirit still haunts the shack, and if you go visit the haunted shack on quiet nights like this, you can hear the ghostly spirits of all the poor souls the camp director took. I didn't believe it for a second. I'm not a paranormal guy, but apparently the rest of the guys were, and since they all looked like they were going to cry, I rolled my eyes, and Russ continued his story. Since I didn't believe my brother, he told me exactly how to get to the shack. If you guys are down, we could find it right now. There was an immediate protest from the group. I spoke up first, saying, No way, dude. Not because I'm scared of your stupid ghost, but I'm scared of getting caught and kicked out of camp. Russ laughed and called me something I'm not going to type here, and he always had a way of manipulating people into doing what he wanted. After a several minute debate, he got everybody to agree to go except me and I was labeled the coward of the group. He says, If you're not afraid of the ghosts, then you won't mind being the one that enters the shack. If you do that, we'd have to tell everyone here how tough and brave you are. Yeah, sadly, that's what he actually said, and that worked on me. More out of anger and annoyance, I just finally agreed to go. We started walking into the thick brush of the forest, and once the camp lights were out of sight, we turned on our flashlights as we traveled through the part of the forest where there weren't any trails. There was barely any room to even walk. I'm not sure exactly how far we walked, but after a little while, I couldn't believe my eyes. There in front of me was an old, decrepit shack, dominated by nature surrounding it. I started to hear some of my bunkmates saying no way and other forms of just banter, and I started to think to myself, maybe Russ was telling the truth after all. He demanded that I go check it out, and I was scared. I thought about his story, and even though I don't believe in ghosts, just being around this abandoned shack in the middle of the night after hearing that story, I honestly felt like I was going to pee my pants. I started to get egged on by the group hearing things like, you were so tough, what happened? And other forms of mockery. I had to check it out since I did make it here, might as well. And I slowly made my way to the door. I barged through, was able to make it inside, and this was bigger than a shack. It was more like a small cabin, maybe the size of a studio apartment or something or even a one-bedroom apartment. The inside was completely destroyed, and as I walked through and shined my light, I noticed something strange on the ground. There was a bottle of beer, and I'm not joking, it was cold when I touched it. I could see the perspiration ring from the bottle on the wood floor. I shined my light up, and further in the distance was a plastic bag, and coming out of the plastic bag was an open bag of chips. At this moment, I couldn't put the pieces together in my head fast enough. I was intrigued, scared, and confused all at the same time. In the back of the shack seemed to be a small room, and when I eventually made it to this room, I stopped and shined the light all around. As the light got to the corner of the room, I saw it. A woman, standing there. And I swear to God, my skin legitimately turned cold, and I immediately felt sick. She held her hands up, 
and sort of in like a quivering voice, she said, Don't say anything. She didn't look scared. She looked almost angry, like she was warning me. I heard Russ shout from outside if I was okay, and I didn't answer because the woman was shaking her head at me not to. After my brief silence, and against my better judgment, I decided to scream the word, run, and I started to run out of the shack. I heard the woman curse something, but I didn't turn back, but I could hear her struggling to run through the shack, seemingly giving chase. When I got outside, I screamed at the group that someone was in there and we needed to run. They all looked confused like I was messing with them, but then the woman jumped through the doorway, screaming something unintelligible at us, and we immediately all ran back to the camp screaming. We immediately were met by half the staff who were rubbing their eyes but incredibly upset that we snuck out. I tried to explain to them what happened, tried to explain that there was a squatter living inside that camp, but they didn't believe us. They said that they were going to call their parents tomorrow morning, which I was thrilled about. Now I wanted to go home. And the next morning the camp director came into our bunk and sat us all down. He told us that they woke up early and went to the shack in the woods and saw exactly what we described. They even found multiple footprints that went in and out the other direction. For our safety, they ended up calling camp early for everyone, not just our group specifically. They didn't know if this woman or maybe multiple people were dangerous and it definitely wasn't worth risking our lives. I'm so thankful that I got out of the situation unharmed. And it's affected me mentally for years, but I eventually came to peace with the incident. I never spoke to any of those guys again, especially not Russ, even though they did say that it was kind of hardcore to do all of that. At the end of the day, I have no idea what happened to everybody, and it wouldn't surprise me if that idiot's in jail or something, but I'll be honest with you guys. Be careful who you trust and hang out with, because they might just lead you into a situation that could be your last. When I was in my junior year of college, it was recommended to me by one of my advisors and mentors to volunteer at a summer camp for young teens. The idea of a summer camp wasn't really my thing, but this was one of these gigs that would look good on my resume for a potential employer given my degree program, and before the end of the year I researched the area around my hometown and found a camp only about an hour away, and they were looking for counselors. I jumped on the chance and after a phone interview with a guy named Stan, I secured my position. This particular camp started right after the 4th of July and ran until the 3rd week of August. During the duration, we would see several different iterations of campers. On July 5th, which was the day before camp started this year, I drove up to meet Stan and all the other fellow counselors, the staff, and most importantly, to get familiar with the grounds, which were quite large. I arrived at around 11 a.m. and standing right outside of a big house was a tall burly man and they were waving. To the left of the house was a parking lot and the man was gesturing for me to pull in over there. After I parked I started approaching the man with my hand extended to shake and the man started laughing in a sort of jolly southern accent he said, Hey, we hug around here friend. Name's Stan. You must be Cassie? Being hugged by a strange man would usually send me into sort of an uproar, but this guy had a real sort of Santa Claus quality about him, just with a black beard instead of white. I realized quickly while talking to him why all the kids loved him and why this camp had glowing reviews. Stan was a tremendous human being, and he just had a presence that you wanted to be around. He gave me a map and personally started to escort me around the grounds. When we arrived at the lake, in his still ever cheerful voice he said, I'm going to hand you over to my wife now. I have some formality things I need to get done, but you're going to love her, and she'll take you to where all the girls bunk. I looked behind me, and a beautiful older woman was making her way to the lake. She smiled and waved, and in an energetic voice said, Hi Cassie, I'm Paula, Stan's wife. Let me show you where the girls sleep, and then I'll show you where you'll be sleeping and introduce you to the other counselors. The entire walk with Paula was much like the walk with Stan. She was lovely and just a joy to speak with. 
She showed me the cabins and showed me which cabin I would be solely responsible for since every counselor would be responsible for one bunk of campers. Then we made our way to a huge wooden building which was the recreation building. It was where the campers would eat dinner and partake in camp activities and this is where I met all my fellow counselors and we all clicked right away. I was excited about the weeks ahead and figured this wasn't the worst way to spend summer. That night I couldn't sleep. All the counselors had their own cabin to sleep in and it was much nicer than you would expect. It was two of us in a room and the rooms were spacious enough that we would have privacy if we wanted. Since I couldn't sleep I figured that I would take a walk around the grounds. Now my roommate Ashley was sound asleep and didn't wake up when I left the room. I didn't feel like I was sneaking out since Stan and Paula both told me numerous times that the grounds are now my home and I can do whatever I like when I'm not with the children. The grounds were somehow even more beautiful at night. The number of stars in the sky was staggering compared to what I was used to. While I was walking I remembered I had a book in my car and I figured I could grab it and read it in my room until I was tired enough to fall asleep. On my way to the car I passed by the big house that I noticed when I first pulled in. It was a big white mansion and the lights were on inside. I didn't mean to snoop, but as I walked by, I just happened to glance in the windows. I saw Stan and Paula talking to two men I didn't recognize. These two guys were definitely not staff from the camp. I try not to judge people, but these guys look like pretty questionable folks. The demeanor of Stan and Paula was also different from how they carried themselves earlier. I couldn't hear them, but from what I could see... It looked like Stan was yelling at these guys. I honestly didn't think too much about it. It could have just been friends or even family. And it wasn't my business and I just carried on as such. I grabbed my book and started to walk back to my cabin. I passed that white house and just kept walking. When I was about 30 yards away, I heard someone shout my name. I turned around and Paula was practically chasing me. She seemed to get defensive and asked me if I was looking in on them or invading their privacy. I was honest with her and told her that I couldn't sleep so I went for a walk and just grabbed my book. She had a look that I can't really describe, but it felt like she didn't believe me. In a dismissive tone, she says, Okay, dear, we'll head back to your cabin. We got a big day tomorrow. I went back to the cabin and tried to read, but I was too distracted by that weird interaction with Paula. I thought about it for a while and I eventually fell asleep. I woke up the next morning feeling great, even with lack of sleep, and the campers arrived and camp had officially started. The week went on and I eventually forgot about my sort of run-in with Paula, and one night, about a week into camp, I couldn't sleep again. It was around 2 in the morning and I was just laying there. I jumped up because I thought I had heard a noise. I went out into the hall, figuring it was one of the counselors just going to the restroom or maybe even coming back to the cabin after sneaking out. When I got to the landing of the stairs that overlooked the living room, I noticed that all the lights were still off. Even in the dark living room, I could see two figures seemingly going through bags. There was enough light shining through the window from the outdoor sensor light. I didn't say anything at first because I still figured that these two people were probably counselors. I started to slowly creep down into the living room and when I finally reached the bottom, the one figure turned and looked at me. I recognized him right away. It was one of those two guys that I saw my first night walking by Stan in their place. His eyes were wide and his cheeks were completely sunken in. I tried to scream or say anything but I just felt paralyzed. He started to approach me slowly and at the same time he reached for something in the back of his waistband. I finally was able to let out a scream and the other man grabbed him by the shoulder and said, we gotta go now. The man never broke eye contact with me and moved backwards until he stepped back through the door and seemingly ran into the night. Seconds later, a bunch of counselors ran out and saw me shivering at the base of the steps. I was stumbling over my words, but I was able to convey to them what had just happened. One of the counselors called Stan who came down in his four-wheeler right away and I explained to him what happened and then out loud in front of everyone I said, it was the two guys I saw you talking to on the first night here. Stan looked confused and just sort of laughed. In that same jolly voice, he said, Why, sweetie, I don't have any earthly idea what you're talking about. I don't remember talking to anybody that night unless, 
unless they work here at the camp. The back and forth continued for a while, until finally Ashley grabbed me and pulled me away because she could see that I was getting ready to lose it. Stan left eventually and told us that he would be alerting the proper authorities and that we had nothing to worry about. After he left, a few of the guys who left their bags in the living room noticed that their wallets had been stolen, and as terrible as that is, thankfully not all of us had been robbed. The next day I told Paula what had happened and that a few of the guys had got robbed. She looked right at me and said, Whatever you think is going on, you're wrong. There was a terrible incident and it will be taken care of. I decided to leave right after that conversation. Since I didn't sign some contracts or anything crazy like that, I felt like it was within my rights to just say goodbye. And I marched over to Stan and basically told him that I quit in so many words. He didn't stop me from leaving and just apologized for my unpleasant stay. I never pursued this any further and never got really any answers as to who those guys were, what they wanted, and what their relationship with Stan and Paula were. I figured that any legal recourse that I took would basically be a dead end, so I just left it alone. This is the first time I'm telling this story since my brief stay at that summer camp over 15 years ago. I know I made the right choice leaving that day. I had a bad feeling in my stomach that I would certainly see those intruders again if I stayed and I'm happy that I never had to deal with summer camp ever again. When I was 16 years old, my parents made me go to a summer camp that was several hours away from my hometown. Yeah, that's right. I said they made me go. At the time, I started some extracurricular activities that were bringing my grades down and ultimately got me into some legal trouble right at the end of the school year. To keep a watchful eye on me and make sure that I wasn't doing anything illegal, my parents assumed sending me to a camp would be the fix. I hated it at the time and resented my parents. I now realize over a decade later my parents were just trying to help and didn't understand the best course of action. This was one of those camps that lasted the entire length of the summer. It was almost like a boarding school, but instead of school, you were doing more outdoor activities and campish things. You could send your child there for an entire summer or week depending on how much you wanted to pay. I was able to compromise with my parents and we agreed that I could go for three weeks. I was miserable on the car ride up. I was thinking about all my friends hanging out, the girl I liked, and most importantly at the time, my precious Xbox 360 that wasn't going to be played. One thing I noticed right away was the lack of campers my age. This camp had a ton of junior high kids and only a few high schoolers like me. In my cabin where I slept was a group of seven other guys, at least close to my age. These were mostly outdoorsy type kids. They loved hiking, s'mores, and everything about camp. I was an outsider right away. All my cabin mates were returning campers that had been coming for years. They told me right away that I would grow to love the place, that my shy and negative demeanor would wear off, and I didn't believe that for one second. I have never been into the whole kumbaya thing, it's why I never got into sports or any team activities. As far as I was concerned, these three weeks were a jail sentence and I just needed to wait out the clock until it was time to go home. The first five or six days I did just that. I kept to myself and did some mandatory activities. Most of the time I spent in the common room. It was a big cabin in the center of camp that had a pool table, a bunch of books, and most importantly, it was quiet. Most campers spent their days and afternoons out swimming, hiking, and doing all sorts of activities that the camp provided. Toward the end of my first week, one of my cabin mates suggested that I go swimming with them. I said suggested, but he practically begged me to go. I was reluctant because I wasn't fond of my cabin mates or anything about this camp, but I was hot and went anyway. I was shocked to admit to myself that I actually had a great time, and this is when camp started to feel like something more than jail. I was having, believe it or not, fun. I couldn't believe it. After that afternoon, I don't think I ever went back to the common room. I spent my time with my cabin mates and even met a girl named Amy. Being the older kids at camp, we had a much stronger relationship with the counselors. I appreciated that they didn't treat us like children and talk to us like peers. It was always respectful and professional, but at the same time, it felt like we were talking to one of the guys. 
The last weekend of my stay came before I knew it, and I was upset to leave. I almost couldn't admit it, but it was the truth. My parents were coming to pick me up on Sunday afternoon, so my cabin mates and I agreed Friday and Saturday night that we were going to go out of our way to have a memorable weekend. Since I was the quote, bad guy of the group, I stole a bunch of snacks and we loaded up our cabin. We were going to stay up all night playing card games and just hanging out, nothing too crazy. Now ordinarily I would suggest something like sneaking out or something like that, but I didn't even want to do anything that crazy, I just wanted to hang out with my new friends. A little after midnight, a few of the guys fell asleep. Four of us were playing blackjack and using some mini candy as betting chips. One of my friends who was lying in bed but not sleeping jumped up erratically and shouted, Whoa! What the heck was that? His sudden movement and sharp tone caused us all to be a little alarmed. We asked what he was talking about. He paused for a minute and staring out the windows he said, I, I swear I just saw someone in that tree and when we made eye contact he, j he just jumped down and ran. Now we all laughed, thinking that he was just being an idiot. The windows aren't like normal windows. Across the top of the cabin where the walls meet the ceiling is a long window that goes around the entire perimeter of the cabin. He got upset and even had tears in his eyes. Now if this was a joke, he was fully dedicated to the prank at this point. One of my friends doubted him, claiming that there was no way that you could see out the windows of the cabin, especially at this hour, and he began to disagree passionately. He told us to lie down on his bed and stare up at the window. And by God, he was right. You could see the trees out of the window, and in a loud, nervous voice, he said, I, I was just looking for the tree, and I thought I saw a face. I, I know that sounds crazy, but I, ju I just kept staring and, and didn't say anything. When, when I started to really focus, I, I could finally see it. It was a face, and it was staring right at me. When I reacted, he jumped down. I heard his feet hit the ground, dude. One of my friends suggested that we go outside and look at the dirt below the tree. If it had footprints or any sign of activity, we would alert the counselors, but if it didn't, we'd just chalk it up to his imagination. Two friends and I went outside, and we didn't even need to make it to the tree. Standing right beside the cabin, almost like he was hiding, was a person. We stopped abruptly, pointing, and the man heard us, looked with one of the most horrifying faces I'd ever seen, and ran into the woods. We all ran as fast as we could back into the cabin. We were shouting, but not loud enough that the counselors would have heard us. Instead of waking them up, for some reason, we decided to deliberate on the situation and figure out the best course of action. Before reaching a decision, without notice, one of the counselors ran into our cabin, shut the door, and immediately locked it. He was tense, and in almost shout he said, Turn off the lights, get into your beds. We tried to ask what was wrong, telling him what we saw, but he was almost ignoring us. A few minutes later we saw the lights of the park ranger trucks. The counselor ran out to speak with the rangers, and seconds later, all the other counselors were there speaking to the rangers, and one of the rangers was a blonde woman. I couldn't hear what any of them were saying, he looked erratic and nervous as he was shouting at her. She pointed to the forest and nodded and then the rangers got into their trucks and started to drive away. The counselors all stayed out in the center of the cabins talking for a few minutes. Each one of them eventually went to the various cabins and told us it was a false alarm and that we needed to go to bed. We were furious and wanted to know what was going on and if it had anything to do with what we just saw and instead of answering us. They just kept shushing us and telling us that it was nothing. Nobody was there. We didn't sleep that night, and honestly nothing happened the next day. I tossed and turned all night on Saturday night as well. Sunday morning came and my parents came to pick me up. I told them what happened and they asked the camp director, who told my parents that one of the campers was playing a prank and scaring the other cabins. One of the counselors thought it was a real threat and called the rangers in. He assured my parents that it was a false alarm and nothing to worry about, but I didn't buy that for one second. I saw that man's face clearly, and even though it was dark, the man was at least in his early 40s. To this day, I'm still friends with the guys from the cabin, and just recently, we all caught up and reminisced about that night, and every single one of them remembers it the exact same way as me. 
I don't know what happened that night. I don't know who that guy was or what he wanted. Most importantly, I don't know why the camp wouldn't admit anything. Maybe it was bad publicity. But either way, that was one of the most horrifying experiences in my life, and I'll never forget the look on that creep's face. I've always loved camps and summer camps, even stemming back to movies like Heavyweights or Camp Nowhere that I watched before I even attended any summer camp. There was a popular summer camp here in the Northeast that I started attending when I was maybe 12 or 13 years old. We had a family friend that worked there and was able to give my parents a discount because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to afford to send me. I attended camp almost every summer during my teenage years creating great memories and friendships that lasted a very long time. Once college came along, I took a break over the summer to do internships that were required for graduation. I was also working part-time at a local grocery store to make some actual money to do things with my friends, pay for a cell phone, etc. After graduation, the first thing I wanted to do was find a new job. I had enough retail work for the rest of my life and wanted to try to find something different. I got a few interviews but wasn't able to land anything concrete. June rolls along and my parents have that same family friend over for dinner that still works at the summer camp. My parents mentioned that I had been looking for a job and she says, well why don't you come work at the camp? They're always looking for help and I could put in a good word. Sure, I thought. It beats the hell out of scanning and bagging groceries and putting carts away. I had a very informal interview over the phone and basically talking about myself and experience as a kid at the camp. They basically gave me the job on the spot because after a few questions they said I would work two weeks and could either go home for a week or stay and work through while the session changed over. Campers could stay in between sessions as well but at this camp the main sessions were two week overnights. I decided that I would work two weeks and then take a week off and if it went well then I would consider stay during the shift week to make some extra money. The job was really easy. I wasn't really a counselor. I helped more in the kitchen or with some of the outdoor activities and really just floated around to whichever area needed me or needed the most help. I had made it through almost the entire summer without incident. I hadn't messed up on the job and all the kids were pleasant and we didn't really have any major issues. Since we weren't counselors, we had our own living quarters and places to sleep. The counselors and co-counselors stayed in the bunks where some of the other workers had a little more freedom. Some of the other workers in similar positions to mine lived close enough to just go home each day. And I remember one night in, I think August, it was especially hot. I was having trouble sleeping, I couldn't get comfortable and was tossing and turning for hours. I decided to get up, grab some water and just pop outside to see if the night air was any more refreshing. I quietly ducked out the main door and was relieved at how nice the night air felt, much more comfortable than it was inside. I took a few sips of water and started looking up at the night sky when I noticed something out of my peripherals. There was something flashing outside of one of the bunks, like something was blocking or shaking the light outside one of the cabins. I started to move closer and saw something outside the door under the light. I thought maybe it was a raccoon. I even remember thinking, Please tell me it's not a baby bear. But as I got closer, it was a kid. A little boy. He was pointing at the light and waving his arm up and down while still pointing. Hey there, are you okay? I whispered. He just kept pointing at the light and then every ten seconds or so, slowly moving his arm up and down while still maintaining the pointing motion. Is this your bunk? I said, and still nothing. Okay, okay, let's go inside and go to sleep now. And the boy obliged and headed inside with me when I opened the door. I woke up the co-counselor and said, Hey, there was just a kid outside your bunk. Someone who could have easily wandered off. He was surprised and said, How did he get outside? I shrugged and just said, I, I don't know. He looked annoyed and responded, I'll talk to Alex tomorrow and see what happened. I remember just walking off annoyed and upset. I didn't know the rules, but I did know that there were training and safeguards to make sure that the campers were safe at all times. And clearly, some type of protocol was bypassed for a camper to be out at night unattended. 
The next day was really busy and the incident left my mind briefly until I headed over to the main building with some arts and crafts supplies for a project the kids would be working on. When I got to the art room, there were a few kids fishing up some projects and getting ready to head down the hall to eat and I saw the same boy from last night. This time he was standing in the corner with his face looking directly at the wall. I looked over to one of the coworkers and said, what's going on? She looked at him and she said, I, I don't know, he isn't responding to me either. I walked over to the corner, hey buddy, do you remember me? What do you say we go and grab something to eat? And no response. But I did notice it wasn't completely silent. I was hearing something like whispers, like someone was talking but I couldn't make out the words. As I got closer it grew a little bit louder and I could now see the boy's mouth moving and his eyes were closed. He was whispering very fast and very low. I tapped him on the shoulder and he bolted with a huge smile on his face. Hi, I'm Timmy. He said as he turned away from the wall and started skipping towards the door to head to the cafeteria. Another day passed and I was up out of bed early just like every morning. I usually took a walk before I showered and I liked to be up before the day got too busy and everyone was up and using the facilities, but this morning there were a lot of my coworkers already up and outside. They were all huddled together talking, so I slowly walked over and said to them, Wow, you're all up early today. Yeah, we didn't get much sleep. One of Alexander's campers had to go home in the middle of the night. It sounded like he had some sort of episode. It, it, it freaked out a lot of the other campers and a few of them got picked up by their parents as well. It was the talk of the camp for the next few days with stories playing the game of telephone and becoming more and more exaggerated every time I heard it. One thing that I did hear from a senior counselor that I was never able to confirm is there were scratches of some type of carvings under the little boy's bunk and that he decided to replace a few of the boards but I think they may have just been camp gossip and not actually real. I haven't been back to the camp in years, but every now and again I think about it and all the good memories that I made, and every so often I think about this story and wonder what really happened with that poor boy. I love being alone. I secured my dream job when I was 20 years old and I moved to a secluded area near a lake to be alone. My job is all on the computer and I'm able to design my products in solitude and send them in. I know most people think I'm depressed or angry, but the truth is, I just love quiet and my own company. A few years ago, a family bought a ton of land near me and opened a summer camp. I was furious about this. I just prayed that it was far enough away that I wouldn't be sucked into the ruckus of the camp. My nightmares came true. At the beginning of summer, I would hear all of the cheering and activities all day long, even some nights were loud. I fought for any kind of justice, but they weren't doing anything wrong. Annoying me isn't a crime, even though I wish it was. It took me a few years, but I finally got used to all the noise. I remember I had a run-in with one of the staff members one time because he was trespassing on my property, and I'll never forget his smug attitude. He looked right at me and said, Settle down, lady. I didn't know. You're acting like the Grinch. And he walked away laughing. After that day, occasionally a few older kids will walk near my house and I can hear them saying things like, That's where the Grinch lives. And other things like that. I didn't care about that and I sort of embraced the nickname after a while. I eventually got the owners of the camp to put these yellow markers on my property line. This would show the staff and campers not to go past the line and to the owner's credit, he enforced it. I even heard a story that he sent a kid home for walking past the line. I don't know if that's true, but it's what I heard. And it took time, but they eventually started to mind their own business altogether. I ended up getting cameras installed on the property, and truthfully, I never saw anyone messing with me for several years. Until last year, and that's when everything hit the fan. Camp started like it did every year. I geared myself up to deal with it for the next several months. One night, I got an alert that my camera picked up. It was far too late for any of the campers, so I figured it was a bear or something like that. It was well after 3am and I pulled up the feed. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was a group of three campers. It was two boys and a girl. 
and I was beyond angry. They were just standing on the line of my property, but not passing it. I couldn't hear them on the camera, but I could see that they were pointing at my house. I could see them laughing and sort of shoving each other. One of the boys decided to venture onto my property, and I lost my mind. I grabbed a metal cane that I owned, and I was nearly about to go outside and give these kids a piece of my mind, and when I turned around, all three were gone. I didn't know if they went back to the camp or if they were fully on my property now, but the next thing I knew, there was a knock on my door, and I froze. I started making my way to the front door, and there was a knock on the back door. I started walking toward the back door, and I looked out the window, and I saw one of the boys standing at the door. While I was looking at the back door, I heard the front door open. Now I know I locked it, so whoever this kid was, he somehow broke the lock and opened the door. And I heard this cocky voice echoing down the hall. Hello, Grinchy. Are you in here? We just want to see you. I heard the girl and he were laughing, and I hid behind the door to my back room. I heard one of the kids open the back door and say, This is Grinchy's house. You think she's home? I was scared. I know these were teenagers, but it was three against one, and these two boys were big for teenagers. I heard all three of the kids exploring my house and whistling and calling me by my camp-given nickname, as I told you. I know at least one of them was upstairs because I could hear the footsteps above me, and another one walked into the room that I was hiding. He was going through desk drawers and looking through all my stuff. They finally left, after what seemed like forever, and when I looked at my house afterward, I felt sick. They stole a bunch of stuff from me and just made my house look like a complete wreck. I couldn't understand why anybody would just do something so horrible for no reason. I immediately called the police, and they got to my house in about 30 minutes. I reported what happened, and of course, I didn't have proof. One of the teenagers went on my computer seemingly deleting all of the video files that I had connected to my camera, and I didn't know if there was a way to retrieve them or not. I went to the camp the next morning. I told the owner, who basically accused me of lying since our relationship at that point had not been the best. He thought I was trying another attempt to ruin him and his camp. Those were his words, not mine. I put the house up for sale not long after that incident and moved to another beautiful secluded location. I don't know how scary this story may be for you, but when you're trapped in your own house and you have unpredictable teenagers who actively don't like you, sneaking around, you let me know if you're scared too. I know I'm not the easiest person to get along with, but what those kids did to me is completely uncalled for and just goes to show you that some people are just horrible human beings. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. EST. And super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official. And maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to sip your Joel juice.